Now we already know that pain can be modulated. This means it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of tissue damage and the amount of pain experienced. But it's even more clever than this because the body has its own endogenous analgesic system. It has its own way of turning off pain or its own way of reducing pain. Now at first thinking this sounds ridiculous. We know that pain is there to protect the tissues of the body from damage. If the pain's not there, tissues will be damaged, there's going to be infection and eventually the person's going to die as a result of that. So we need pain to protect the body's tissues. So why on earth would the body want to have a system of significantly reducing or almost abolishing turning off pain? Well, imagine you're in this situation. You're being chased by the enemy tribe or by a saber-toothed tiger or something like that. You're running across a field, you fall and you sprain your ankle. Now we've already said that sprains are very painful, so you're going to have pain. Pain's good, that's going to protect the tissues of the body and your ankle's going to make a nice recovery in about two weeks time. But meantime, the enemy tribe's caught up with you and killed you. Or the saber toothed tiger's eating you up. Stopping to nurse your sprained ankle is going to reduce the overall probability that you are going to survive. Or suppose a parent's in a difficult situation, they're injured, but their child is being attacked by a crocodile or something. The parent can ignore the pain they have while they rescue the child or rescue another member of their family or another member of their tribe. It promotes survival. So yes, pain's good, it promotes recovery, it prevents tissue damage, but sometimes pain can reduce the probability of survival. And the body is designed to survive. If we're designed to do anything, it is to survive. So we have this amazing, complete analgesic system inside the body that can turn off pain when it's appropriate. You might have even noticed this when you're playing a game of football or some sport that you actually get a bash during the game, it doesn't hurt, but then at the end of the game you think, oh actually that really hurts. Because when you were caught up in the excitement, when you were caught up in the emotion of the game, your body's analgesic system put you into survival mode and turned the pain down or turned the pain off. Quite amazing really. This is a very common report to soldiers that have been in combat. In combat, they are in absolute survival situations. Either the enemy is going to die or they're going to die. And soldiers have received horrendous injuries that haven't been painful at the time because they know that if they stopped at the time, either they would be killed or their friends would be killed. It's about surviving. So where does this idea of survival come from? Well, it really only comes from what we can call the mind. So let's call it the higher senses, the frontal lobes and things like that. So here we have the brain, which we could call the, the mind is located there in the brain. And sometimes the brain thinks, we're in a survival situation here, we need to turn the pain off. And in this case, impulses seem to go to the hypothalamus in the first instance. So the mind communicates with the hypothalamus and it says we are in a survival situation here. Let's not have pain at the moment. Then the next thing down is we've got the brain stem. And we know that the brain stems in three parts. There's the midbrain, the pons, and at the bottom the medulla oblongata and that, that is continuous with the spinal cord. Now just a couple bits of anatomy before we get into this. There's an area of grey matter here and this area of grey matter here is called the periaqueductal grey matter. Periaqueductal grey matter. And this goes around about the aqueduct, the cerebral aqueduct. In the old days it was called the aqueduct of Silvius. These days we call it the cerebral aqueduct. And it connects the third ventricle above with the fourth ventricle 
below and it goes through the midbrain. So the cerebral aqueduct is going through the midbrain and it's surrounded by periaqueductal grey matter. So here we have the periaqueductal grey matter. And a little lower down here, we have another important nucleus, and that one's called the Rafe nucleus. So here we have the Rafe nucleus. Now, when the mind decides that it's going to reduce our survival probabilities to have pain, then a neuron in the hypothalamus communicates down into the periaqueduct or grey matter. And the periaqueduct or grey matter is like the relay centre, it's the coordinating centre for the body's analgesic system. Now, in experimental animals, this was discovered first in rats, if you artificially electrically stimulate the periaqueduct or grey matter, electrically stimulate that, then basically the animal becomes insensitive to pain. The animal ceases to feel pain and won't withdraw from a painful stimulus by electrically stimulating this periaqueduct or grey matter. So this seems to be the coordinating centre for the analgesic system, but it comes from the mind via the hypothalamus and becomes overtly physiological at the level of the periaqueduct or grey matter. And then from the periaqueduct or grey matter, there's another neuron that goes down and connects with the, uh, the Rafe nucleus lower down between the pons and the medulla oblongata. So when the periaqueductal grey matter is activated, this is going to send analgesic impulses down through the brainstem. And then there's going to be another descending neuron here, going down one side of the spinal cord, like this. And at the appropriate level of the spinal cord, this will have an influence. And we'll see how it does that in a minute. So what we've said is the mind decides pain is going to reduce our probability of survival. Communicating with the hypothalamus and the PAGM, periaqueductal or grey matter. This is coordinating and initiating the physiology of the analgesia. And analgesic impulses are going down to the Rafe nucleus and down the spinal cord. And as these impulses go down the spinal cord, I'm now going to show you where they go in the spinal cord. So here we have the uh, diagram we used to have the spinal cord with the uh, grey matter and the white matter, the dorsal horns here. And these descending analgesic pathways go down the spinal cord and they are dorsolateral pathways. They are dorsolateral. This means they're near the back, this is the back. Dorsum, the dorsal surface. This is the front. And they're towards the edge, they're dorsolateral. So going down the spinal cord on both sides, we have descending dorsolateral analgesic pathways. This is built in to the hard wiring. It is part of the anatomy, part of the anatomy of the, of the spinal cord and the brain. Now, we know that a painful impulse comes in from the cell body here. That's the dendrite of the cell body there. The axon of the cell body is coming in here. We know that this neuron terminates that there's a physical gap here, the synaptic gap, just here. And this then goes across and up towards the brain in the spinothalamic tract. But if it's inappropriate to feel pain, we've got analgesic impulses coming down these dorsolateral tracts. Then what happens at the appropriate level of the spinal cord is a neuron will project from these dorsolateral tracts into the area of the synapse. And it's into the area of the synapse 
between the axon of the sensory neuron and the start of the secondary neuron which is going to take the pain impulse up towards the brain. So for the pain impulse to get from the periphery up towards the brain it's got to go across that synapse there. It's got to go from the first order neuron to the second order neuron. So if the impulse could be blocked at this point, if the impulse could be blocked at this point, then that would mean that yes, the painful impulse would be generated here, but it would be blocked in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. It would not be able to ascend up towards the brain. It could be blocked. And this is exactly how the body's own intrinsic analgesic system works. So if we imagine that here we have the, um, here we have the axon coming in. So what we've got here now is a blow up of this diagram. So the, um, the cell body of the sensory neuron will be there. This will be the axon of the sensory neuron. And here we have it coming into the spinal cord. So this is now in, this bit here is now in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And there's a wider bit before it synapses with the second order neuron. Then there's the physical synaptic gap. And then we have the second order neuron here. Now, what happens is that the analgesic neuron is, let's draw this one in red, is coming down here. And it terminates here like this. And the transmitter released by this analgesic neuron, this pain inhibitory pathway neuron, which has come down in the dorsolateral tracts from the periaqueductal grey matter and the Rafe nucleus. This neuron here, dedicated to analgesic purposes, contains chemical transmitters. in the terminal portion of the neuron. And presynaptically here, there are specific receptor sites and postsynaptically the specific receptor sites as well. So when this analgesic neuron releases its chemical transmitter, that's going to fit on to presynaptic receptor sites and it's going to fit onto postsynaptic receptor sites. And when the chemical transmitter from the analgesic neuron binds onto the receptor sites in the presynaptic neuron, that's going to bring about presynaptic inhibition. That's going to stop that working. And also, when this chemical transmitter binds on to receptor sites on the postsynaptic neuron, that is also going to inhibit ongoing propagation of the nerve impulse. So there's postsynaptic inhibition as well. So this chemical transmitter causes presynaptic and postsynaptic inhibition. So normally the pain impulse would come from the first order neuron coming from the periphery Normally, it would release its own chemical transmitter, glutamate or substance P. It would stimulate the receptor sites and the postsynaptic neuron, causing the propagation of a new nerve impulse in the secondary neuron, taking the pain up the spinothalamic tracts to the brain. But now, because the body has decided that pain would reduce our probability of survival, this is going to be blocked. This is presynaptically, this is not going to work. Postsynaptically, this is not going to work. So in other words, what basically has happened, the impulse is here, but this whole area is turned off. This whole area is turned off in the dorsal horn, meaning the impulse is blocked. 
so the impulse coming in from the periphery cannot ascend. The pain has been blocked. And the chemical transmitters here are opioids. They are opioids. The body makes its own opium type molecules, endorphin molecules, enkephalin molecules for example are opioids and they block the ongoing propagation of the nerve impulse. So these can be described as the body's own intrinsic or endogenous opioids. The body makes opium type molecules. Now if you give the patient opium type molecules, for example if you give them an injection of morphine or diamorphine, then the morphine based drug that you give, the opioid based drug that you will give, will have exactly the same effect. It will fit into the chemical receptors in the pre and post synaptic neuron and it will reduce the propagation of pain. <coughs> so for some strange reason a molecule grown from an opium poppy is the same shape and has similar chemical properties to the body's own natural opioids. But the reason opium works is it fits in these chemical receptor sites blocking apparent ascending pain pathways. Now there's opiate receptors in the upper parts of the brain as well. There's opium receptors up in the periaqueductal grey matter and in the rafe nucleus. These opium receptors aren't restricted to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So when you give a patient opiates it is working in the brain as well as working in the spinal cord. And also this system uses other chemical transmitters as well. So for example it uses 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine, that's commonly called serotonin, and it uses noradrenaline. Serotonin and noradrenaline are also involved in this system. And of course a group of drugs that affect serotonin and noradrenaline metabolism are the tricyclic antidepressant drugs. So tricyclic antidepressant drugs can reduce long-term chronic pain because they're acting on this system, they're stimulating this system and the traditional way it's been postulated is that the tricyclic antidepressants increase the amount of serotonin, increase the amount of um, noradrenaline, therefore increase descending inhibition. And also GABA is involved in this pathway. GABA is another chemical transmitter, gamma amino butyric acid. And GABA can be affected by a drug we also give for chronic pain called gabapentin. So this explains why, how opiates work and how drugs we use for chronic pain such as tricyclic antidepressants and gabapentin can have an analgesic effect. So we have this amazing built-in analgesic system. When the mind decides it's inappropriate to feel pain, it will reduce our probability of survival. All the anatomy and physiology is waiting there completely at the mind's disposal and can switch pain off for a period of time. However, this will work for a period of time when the person is at risk or significant others are at risk or when the patient has to get into your A&E department. But then once they are in your A&E department, they no longer have to take action because they're dependent on you, not on themselves, and very often the pain returns. So it's not uncommon to find people complaining of increasing amounts of pain in the time after their admission. So the body's own analgesic system, descending inhibition of ascending afferent pain impulses.